And I guess we are live now. So welcome everyone uh, to this episode of JS Congress Meets. This time we are meeting uh, Ian and Julia from the Mozilla Spider Monkey team. I am Johannes and this is Natalie. We are the hosts for this edition. So let's get it started. Before we go into details about Spider Monkey, we'd like to know who are you and what are you doing at Spider Monkey and how did you get into it? So Julia, what about you? Uh, <laughs> sorry, I, I kind of blanked a little bit on the first question. Who am I? Yeah. And how did I end up in this situation? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, my name is Julia Startup. Uh, I am a software developer on Spider Monkey. I work primarily on the uh, on the front end of SpiderMonkey, and I also work on representing Mozilla at TC39. So that's mm -hmm. the committee that standardizes the JavaScript language. Uh, how did I end up here? I have many questions about it myself, so mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess it's as good as mine. <laughs> okay. And how are you dealing with the home office situation? We talked um, in our checkup before about yeah. sitting at home and not getting in touch with all the awesome people in the office so yeah um as as i mentioned in our checkup it's really amazing the people that you meet at the office so mm -hmm. going into the office you just get to talk and have these amazing conversations with really interesting people mm -hmm. but for me personally i actually prefer to work from home uh, so i was going in not so often and now i'm not going in at all it hasn't affected me as much though i miss the conversations okay Thank you for sharing. Ian, uh, I would like to ask you, can you please introduce yourself and what are you doing at Spider Monkey, and how did you get involved? Sure. Uh, so my name is Ian Ireland. Um, I've been working at Mozilla for a little over two years now, I think. Um, and I am also a software developer on Spider Monkey, but I focus more on the, the back end of the of the engine, so the JIT compilers and the optimization work. Um, I did my master's in computer science at the University of Alberta here in Canada, and then I spent five years working at IBM on their COBOL compiler. Um, and then I decided that I had spent enough time working on ancient, ancient languages and decided to start optimizing a newer language um, and then a position opened up on Spider Monkey, and mm -hmm. it's been really great. And um, there's just so many great people to work with, um, really, really smart people, and um, we get to do a lot of really interesting work. So I'm really happy with it. And how are you dealing with the office situation? Are you currently in your home office, uh, or are you going to the office back again? Uh, so when the uh, coronavirus pandemic started, I was living in Toronto, uh, but then my partner uh, got a professorship at the University of the Fraser Valley in Abbotsford. And so we moved across the country. Um, so um, previously I was actually going into the Toronto office every day, but there is no office in Abbotsford and the Vancouver office is a little too far. So mm -hmm. I'm working from home and will continue to do that even after um, everything opens up again. But when things open up, I may occasionally go in and see people in Vancouver. All right. So Johannes, we had the question in a, one of our episodes before, who are you? All right, uh, we forgot to introduce ourselves. So hi, I'm Johannes. I'm uh, one of the organizers behind JS Congress. And uh, since the situation uh, happened, like earlier this year, we decided to do try out like this live streaming series called JS Congress Meets Friends. And that's I am. Um, and by the way, asking each other, so Natalie, we already know your name, but can you introduce yourself? What are you doing and what brings you in this situation? So what brought me in this situation? So I get, got in touch with uh, JS Congress last year and we had a trip to Ghana. So maybe you'd like to check JS Congress Goes Ghana on Twitter. And after that, I was asked to join the... JS Congress team. And on Monday, Johannes asked me, ah, maybe you're interested to join the moderation and hosting team today. And I said, okay. 
let's do it. I'm not nervous or I don't know. So yeah, let's try. <laughs> so uh, we prepared a few questions about um, Spider Monkey and what's happening there. And the first question is, uh, what is Spider Mon Monkey? So. So Spider Monkey is the JavaScript engine inside of Firefox. Uh, it's responsible for running JavaScript and making all the JavaScript do things. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it doesn't do anything related to HTML. All of the layout and the DOM objects happen in a different component of the browser. Um, but any, anything where we need to run JavaScript is, is being done by Spider Monkey. So the browser will give us some JavaScript, JavaScript some JavaScript source, and then we will do everything. And then that JavaScript may call into other parts of the browser to do things. Um, it also includes a bunch of other components, um, garbage collectors to clean up the memory that you're not using after you're done with it. But it's mostly just there for running JavaScript. Uh, by the way, Spider Monkey, we are big Animan fans. Uh, fans. So, uh, like taking a look at the history of Spider Monkey, there have been involved a couple of monkeys, like Trace Monkey, Jaeger Monkey, Iron Monkey, Odin Monkey. Uh, can you give us a brief summary about the history of those, and especially about the naming? I'd be interested in where is the animal part coming from. Sure. So Spider Monkey was um, the original name of the entire JavaScript engine. Um, I think that dates back to 1996 or so. It's a really, really old engine. Um, and then in 2008-ish, I believe, when we first started creating compilers instead of just an interpreter, um, we came up with TraceMonkey, which was using a uh, fancy paper about tracing JITs. And um, so Trace Monkey seemed like a logical name. And then eventually we wanted to add more compilers. And so they added a new one called Jaeger Monkey. I don't actually know why Jaeger Monkey was called a Jaeger Monkey. Um, but then it. afterwards, Ion Monkey came in, which is the oldest monkey that we have that is still in service, other than still Spider living. Monkey. Um, but I do know that Ion Monkey exists, or it's called Ion Monkey, at least in part because somebody really wanted to have a function in the code base called fire the ion cannon. And uh, that was the thing that like kicked off some Ion Monkey code. And then we just decided to call it Ion Monkey. Um, and then there's also um, Odin Monkey, which was our compiler for Asm.js, um, which was a very clever hack for making C like code run fast in the browser. And then when that seemed like a good idea, um, people went out and signed WebAssembly. And so WebAssembly had Balder Monkey and then eventually had Rob Balder Monkey. Um, lately, we've kind of gotten off of the monkey names, but we have a project going on that is currently, we call it Warp, which is either Warp Builder or Warp Monkey. Um, and maybe if you apply enough pressure, we can, we can turn it into a monkey and have warp monkey as well, in which case we might get t-shirts. We'll get t-shirts either way. I'm already working on them. <laughs> oh, if we get t-shirts, it's a monkey. Warp monkey. Yeah. You heard it here first. It's it's all it's all it's all t-shirts and it's all monkeys. Um, we also have, uh, and unfortunately I, I took it out from the stuff that we were going to discuss, but um, we have a on pause project, which is a parser rewrite called Smoosh Monkey. So if you go back into the history of the JavaScript, there was this great cataclysm called Smooshgate. And uh, this is essentially about flat map and the fact that we couldn't use uh, flatten as a, um, as a term for that. Uh, and the, uh, the champion, the person who was pushing the proposal forward through the committee, uh, TC39, the committee that designs JS, uh, he was like, ah, let's just name it Smoosh as a joke. But nobody could tell it was a joke because it's the internet and you can't do sarcasm in text. Um, and people took it uh, really hard, uh, but it was also kind of funny. So we named the new parser frontend Smoosh Monkey because it's a, it's a generator parser. Uh, it's a parser generator. And um, you have this thing in parser generators, which are conflicts when you're uh, like you're building tables of uh, legal actions that you can do in the parser. Uh, and you can have these funny conflicts and they're called like reduce, reduce conflicts. And we renamed everything to Smoosh. So that's where that name comes from. Um, 
Also, Spider Monkey itself has a funny name origin. So uh, the reason it's called Spider Monkey, it's the second oldest engine in uh, that runs JavaScript. The oldest being, I think it's called Mocha, which was written by Brendan Eich in 10 days. Spider Monkey is the rewrite of Mocha. And uh, it's called Spider Monkey because it's really ugly. That's where the names come from. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, the original version of it is it had these really long arms that stretched out into different components in the code base and it was just really messy. It doesn't look like that now, but we've kept the name. Jaeger Monkey is named after exactly what you think it's named after, which is Jägermeister. I mean, bottles, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I don't know why they chose that name, but I think that it's about as good a name as any of the other monkeys. I'm interested in how Jägermeister has been involved in name finding. Well, it's, I guess it's probably somewhere along the lines of uh, Balmer's Peak, where you know you have a certain blood alcohol concentration for programming. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, spider monkeys and its arms are reaching to lots of other projects. How widely used is spider monkey? And do you have any ideas how many projects besides Firefox are using spider monkey? So, we aren't the best at tracking that. Uh, we've been trying to get better at it. Um, so the, the world of embedders has been pretty dominated by V8, but we do have a couple of embedders who use our engine. Uh, a good example is MongoDB uses us, uh, CouchDB also. Um, I think there might be other databases, but I'm not 100% sure. We're also embedded, uh, we're also an, the engine that's embedded in um, Gentoo, I think. Was it Gentoo? Um, Gnome or GTP? Gnome, it was Gnome, yeah, thank yeah. you. Uh, so uh, there's this thing called MozJS that's maintained by some of the folks who work on GNOME. Um, we're also embedded in Servo. So that's uh, that used to be uh, maintained by Mozilla. The current situation with that project's unknown, uh, but we're technically embedded in that as well and in a couple of other places. So there's a, a few larger companies who use us too. Um, but it's not nearly as broad an embedder audience as, for example, V8. Okay. So uh, we heard a lot of the history of Spider Monkey and where the, all the monkeys, the names came from. Um, MDM Web Docs turned 15 this year in July. And we like to know, you, you told it it's a rewrite and how old is Spider Monkey now and how it's dependent to MDM web docs. Mm -hmm. So spider monkey, or so the, the JavaScript engine mm -hmm. in uh, Netscape at the time was the very first JavaScript engine. Brendan Eck wrote it. Um, that was called Mocha. It was written in 1995. And then um, as Yulia said, there was a rewrite, um, mm -hmm. which then became spider monkey sometime in 1996. I don't actually know whether how significant the rewrite was or whether code was, was copied over. Um, but so 24 or 25 years of code and at the time spider monkey was written in C and now it's written in C plus plus. And that just sort of happened seamlessly over time as we took this C and we're like, well, we're going to use a different compiler for it now. Uh, so it's, it's been quite a journey. Um, and a lot of components have been rewritten, but on our like internal code tracking Things. you can go back and see where code came from and uh, a lot of code you can go back to 1998 when the Netscape code was released open source and there's a commit called release the lizard um, when Mozilla became a thing and sometimes I have been working on bugs and I've tracked down when when did we write this code and it goes all the way back to 1998 in some form or another um, mm -hmm. so since then many components have been rewritten um, lots of new code has been added. We've overhauled a lot of things, but some of the basic structure is still very similar to what it used to be. Okay, I see. And Spider Monkey is used in, uh, in other applications than Firefox. Uh, how are you involved in this project and how you um, get in touch with other teams? How does it work? So the main way that we interact um, with people is we have a, a, I guess it's called element now. It used to be a matrix. It's a chat client. Mozilla has a, 
um, instance, and we have a pound spider monkey channel there. And um, we frequently have a number of embedders, um, the people who work on the GNOME project and so on, um, will come in, ask us questions, and then we have um, a GitHub repository for, you know, here are some tips and tricks for embedding. Um, so we, um, if you're interested in trying to embed uh, Spider Monkey in your own project, that would be a good place to come and ask questions, and we have some resources to point people to. And um, do you work together with TC39 and the mm -hmm. V8 team? How does it work? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, so H TC39. Had some feeling you would say yes. <laughs> with some feeling, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we do. We do definitely work with TC39. Um, so uh, one part of the work that we do with TC39 is we come and we represent our implementer experience to the committee. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's say that a new feature is being designed, but uh, it doesn't make sense for how our engine is implemented, and our concern might also translate to other implementers. Then we might be like, okay, maybe we should design this a little bit differently. Uh, we can keep the same general shape of the new JavaScript feature, but change the internals a bit, make it something different. Um, it also comes like sometimes um, we really like a feature and we help move it forward. We recently did that with generator iterators, which is a uh, iterator helpers. Sorry, I always mix up the name. Uh, iterator helpers is a proposal we recently helped along by doing an implementation in our engine and sort of helping them out with the spec text and asking some questions, getting some answers, also trying to answer some things ourselves. So it's sort of like uh, giving feedback and also directly working on the specification. We do both. Uh, V8 uh, is a part of TC39, but we also collaborate with them more uh, just on a uh, vendor to vendor basis. Like we're both browsers. We both make our own JavaScript engine. And uh, sometimes we both have very similar concerns. So we might work together in that way. So one example of that is um, earlier this year, I spent a bunch of time redoing a bunch of work or getting the regular expression engine inside of SpiderMonkey up to up to par. Um, and the way that we did that is just V8 and SpiderMonkey sh now share a, a code base for the regular expression engine in particular. Um, and we just we can basically pull the regular expression engine code directly from V8, and we have a, a shim layer that allows um, code that was originally written in V8 to run in our stuff. And then we've been contributing some patches back upstream to, um, especially around case folding. There's some really weird semantics in the corners of, of JavaScript for how um, case independent comparisons work. And so we've polished off a few little bugs there. Um, and so we decided that that's one area where it's better to, to combine our resources and share on this one small component rather than having multiple implementations. Okay, thank you. Um, one question to you, Julia. You started implementing the top level away proposal. Can you tell us a bit more about it? Sure. Um, so top level of weight is one of our, uh, one of the bigger proposals that's come through committee recently. Uh, what it is, is if you're familiar with async await syntax or promises in JavaScript, what this is, is a way to do asynchronous work. So like normally you have a file executing synchronously, like each statement goes one after the other. But if you have something asynchronous, it like comes off of this and gets put onto the event queue. And then once whatever synchronous work has been finished, we take whatever's on the event queue and then like execute that. The way that it was done um, in older JavaScript before async await was this promise would just be this thing that's hanging out and it would be like super nested. Like you'd have a promise that would have like a bunch of then statements about what you should do after. And this would happen in the middle of your code base and then you'd have other work that was happening. So the promise would actually be executed after. And it was a little strange. Uh, what async await did is it allowed you to take these promises and make them sort of like they were synchronous. So th the way that you read the code is synchronous, but the work that's happening is asynchronous. What top level await is, is for modules, uh, not for scripts. It doesn't work for scripts. Uh, for modules, uh, so we, what's the difference between a script and a module? Uh, a script is something that you can embed in your web page with the script tag the old fashioned way, and it has all of these um, sort of legacy behaviors. 
modules are uh, dropping some of that. I believe, if I remember correctly, they are all in strict mode by default. And they have some special powers. One of those special powers is top level weight. Another special power is that they can do imports, which regular scripts can't. So modules can import other modules. Top level await uh, will allow you to basically have your module and pause it uh, at the very top level without creating an asynchronous function to Rapid and without creating a promise to Rapid or anything else. So it brings that ease of use that exists now in functions to the top level of the module. Are there any questions yet about how top level await works before I jump into this very incredible implementation? One short, one short sentence because I have the time in my, we have a lots of questions. So I'm not sure, Jovi, what do you think? Um, uh, I'm more interested, like, uh, let's get one level up. Uh, you already mentioned top level away. <laughs> like, what, what would need a, what's the process? Uh, can you give a brief overview about, okay, how I can propose a, idea which I have to involve JavaScript as a language. Mm -hmm. So this is working over TC39, but can you give mm -hmm. us a brief introduction, like how would be the process of uh, just bringing up an idea until it lands in stage four in the full specs? So uh, a really great way to start is we've got a TC39 discourse. And we've also got a website, tc39.es. I don't know why we're Spanish, but we are. Um, so you can go to that website. And in there, you're going to see uh, in the top, there's a link about how to contribute. And uh, also um, community section. The community section will take you to the uh, discourse, TC39 discourse, which will allow you to ask questions like, hey, has anybody ever thought of this feature? That's a really great place to start. So you've got a new idea and it's like, I want to do this. It doesn't exist in JavaScript yet, but let's see if maybe there's some interest. Chances are that if it's something you've seen in another language, it may have been proposed before and there may have been reasons why it didn't get into the language. And there may be a lot of history, for example, 20 years. Uh, take, for example, classes. When were they first proposed? 1996. When did they get, actually get implemented? Like 2015, I think, was when we actually implemented classes. So uh, that's, how, that's how long classes took. Uh, we're trying to make things faster. And the faster process is this thing called harmony, or the four-stage process. So uh, the thing that you do in discourse is you're asking a question. Let's say that someone's like, yeah, actually, that's a really good idea. Let's try doing that thing that you've proposed. Uh, what you would be told is, hey, can you make a repository based off of our proposal template in GitHub, uh, explaining the motivation for the proposal and sort of an idea about how it would be solved. You would also find through the process of going through discourse something called a champion, uh, who is uh, a champion is a person who is a delegate, a person representing a member organization. So ECMA is made up of member organizations who are not people, but companies, or maybe an educational institution or something like this. Mm -hmm. uh, that champion would help you present your proposal to the committee for advancement to stage one. And stage one basically means uh, that the committee thinks that this is a problem space worth exploring and potentially solving. There's some entrance criteria and uh, stage one basically doesn't have entrance criteria. It's basically a taste thing. Uh, but getting to stage two, there's some entrance criteria. Like you should have sort of a sketch of spec text and uh, an idea of how this should be solved. Once something gets into stage two, it means that the committee says, yes, we should solve this problem. That's like the green light of like, we're invested in solving this. We're going to create a design solution for it. Um, entering stage three is probably the most difficult barrier because this is the point at which implementations get involved and people start actually implementing the proposal that you made. So um, passing that barrier is sometimes the hardest one. You have to have a completely designed uh, specification, a completely designed feature, and the questions that are left open should be, uh, there should be no open questions left that haven't been answered that couldn't be answered without an implementation. So entering the implementation phase means we've already covered all of that design work. And then finally, uh, once you've got two implementations at stage three and the editors have signed off on it, it goes to stage four, at which time, at, at which point it becomes a recommendation. And at, uh, in March of every year, we publish the new spec text and that's when it goes into the spec. 
I see. So it gets refined from stage over stage, and as more questions are popping up, as more it gets refined until there is implementation, let's say in Babel or in TypeScript. See how it works. And so TypeScript and Babel don't count. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sure. But uh, what I wanted to say is like, um, like from another perspective, we each stage, like we're iterating over it, refine it, clarify out more details and uh, try to, to uncover the unknowns until it yes. gets to page four. Okay. It's really good that you brought up TypeScript and Babel though, because they're both transpilers um, and they're a really important part of the process because they usually implement earlier than engines do. Uh, and uh, also polyfills. Uh, so at stage two, you, you would want to actually write sort of an example. Like if you're not proposing something that needs a fundamental change to engines, an example of a fundamental change would be something like including weak references into JavaScript, which were actually polyfillable because there was a bug in another spec. Like you, you can find really weird edge cases uh, when you're dealing with specs and implementing them without actually implementing them. Uh, but it's a really important process. Pretty much everything needs to have a polyfill before we'll move it to stage three. I see. By the way, refinement and iterations. Uh, let's talk to them, uh, about optimizations. Um, <laughs> I think in the, in the first part, uh, Ian, you already mentioned a couple of times, uh, like working on optimizations and uh, Julia as well about how the how the whole um, yeah, project got involved. So I'm interested in what are the unique challenges in optimizing a JavaScript engine? Like, um, so examples like I, the hardest part you still remember and what's been some, uh, let's say, cheap wins. So my background is in, is in compilers, um, sort of traditional compilers. So often when people think about compilers, it's like, oh, we're compiling C or C++. Or some language where you compile it once and then you send the code somewhere and you run it a bunch of times. Um, and JavaScript is different because um, you you go to a website, they send you some JavaScript, and you just start running it right away. Um, and so one of the interesting challenges in optimizing JavaScript is that time that we spend compiling JavaScript is time that we don't spend running it. And so we have to have a very careful balance of what do we do when. Um, and so. Yulia works a lot on the on the parser and on the front end that is responsible for trying to get from here is some JavaScript source to here is some some internal representation that we can start executing as quickly as possible. And then once it gets to that point, um, I work on we have a, a set of tiers of different um, compilers or interpreters, different um, engines that each have a different set of performance characteristics. Where we start with something that we can get going really quickly, but is going to run relatively slowly. And then as we have run code more and more, we say, OK, this code looks important. And so we have to spend more time compiling this so that we can, and we think that this will pay off in the future. So one of the interesting challenges in optimizing JavaScript is that you have to do this balance of how much time can I afford to spend um, making things go faster. And the second challenge with JavaScript in particular is that it's a very dynamic language. So if you just imagine you have an, if you just like you have uh, some code that says foo.x, you've got some object and you're accessing the x property on it. Well, what does that mean? It could be a property that is on that object. It might be a property on the prototype. It might be a getter. It might be a getter on the prototype. Um, maybe you have a, a proxy and x never existed, but then it's going to go to the proxy and say, hey, they asked for x. What do you have for me? And so there's a lot of things that could happen at that point. Um, but in practice, when you sort of zoom in on each individual part of JavaScript or each individual bit of real JavaScript code, normally it's only doing one thing uh, out of all of these possibilities. And so we have this um, system called inline caches where whenever JavaScript gives a bunch of options for how something could happen, we, we have just a little hole and we say, okay, the first time I get here, let's just go and do that. But then I'll remember what happened last time and um, leave basically a, a note for myself saying, hey, if next time I get here, we're adding this addition is still two numbers and not like a number and a string or string and undefined, then we will go straight to the number addition path. And then that makes us faster. And so we optimize JavaScript by looking at what has happened before and then assuming that that will continue to happen in the future. Um, 
the, the complicated part is sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you are adding a bunch of numbers together and then a string pops in. And so there's another complication where we always need to make sure that no matter what we've seen before, we can always fall back and we never make any assumptions that we can't undo. Um, so there's a lot of sort of interesting balancing work that goes on there. That's, that's a lot of fun if you're a compiler person. Uh, pretty cool. All right, so my next question would have been like, what's the mechanism to identify which functionality uh, yeah, you are going to optimize? But as you explained, it's like, it's all the time having a focus on the balance. And if there is more weight on the left side, try to figure out, okay, how we can do it in balance on the right side. Yeah, so the, the, the basic idea there that I think everybody, like every JavaScript engine does something like this is when you execute a function, we say, oh, this function is happening more often. So you call the function, we increment a number somewhere. Or if you have a loop in a function, we'll also increment a number to say, ah, oh, yes, this is this is a hot function. Um, and so when, and then um, based on how many times you've looped or called something, that's when we decide that we want to optimize it. Um, and then the other place where we'll try optimizing things once we've decided to go to a higher tier is when all of our little inline cache notes say, yeah, this is always doing the same thing. So you should, generate code specifically for that thing um, because, because we're pretty confident. We heard a lot of um, balancing and making things better and running better and smoother. So um, are there any good hacks in unique challenges in parsing JavaScript? Yeah, ah. <laughs> we have a document on this, uh, if anybody's mm -hmm. curious about reading it. When we were writing the new parser, um, we, uh, we uh, so uh, Jason Orndorff, my colleague uh, who was leading the project, wrote this great document about hacks in JavaScript, like not hacks, but the reality of parsing JavaScript. It's a very mm -hmm. unique language. You can't, for example, uh, so there are these programs called parser generators. You can give it a grammar and be like, give me a parser that'll parse this language and it'll do that for you. But you can't really do it with JavaScript because JavaScript uh, does some things that are super interesting. Um, for example, all of our keywords that are reserved are kind of contextually reserved. They're not really, really reserved. Uh, take for example, if it's been around since JavaScript one and you would think that that's a reserved keyword but you can create an object with if as a, as a property name. So how reserved is it actually? And that's true of all of the reserved keywords. You can use them as properties. Uh, but for the more modern ones, like for example, async await, my personal favorite <laughs> feature at the moment, um, or, uh, or of, it's a little bit trickier um, where, uh, well, for example, uh, await and yield are only, uh, are only going to be parsed as keywords in specific situations. For example, inside of the body of a generator function in the case of yield, or inside of a async function, if it's a wait. Uh, and if we think about yield, uh, so why is that interesting from a parsing perspective? Because mm -hmm. you can't just say that if it's yield, it's this token and you can go and do stuff with that token. No, you have to check where is it in the file uh, and determine like, is this yield minus one, yielding a minus one, or is it minusing one from the variable named yield? So that's an example of fun times with parsing JavaScript. Uh, another one, which is probably my favorite, and you can write it into your, into your console. Uh, it's also coming from Jason's document, where what you do is uh, create a var named of and uh, have that var be like an array of some numbers. Mm -hmm. And then write for of 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 console log and see what you get. <laughs> <laughs> this is absolutely wonderful. Um, what you will get is you'll get console log one, two, three, because of is a valid identifier. It's also a keyword. And in this uh, situation of, um, of parsing this, uh, this thing, uh, in particular in for loops, uh, things get super, super messy. So um, we have of, of, of in a for loop, but what about the async keyword in a for loop? For example, if you're, if you're creating an async function, imagine you've got uh, your parentheses and you write async function, blah, blah, blah. And then it's a C style loop with a semicolon. Um, so C style loops, the way that they look is uh, you do var i equals one, and then i is less than whatever, and then i plus plus, that's a C style mm -hmm. loop. What, it, what if you did this? What if you did async 
of arrow function and then curly braces. This is valid JavaScript also. <laughs> Uh, and this will be parsed as the of is an identifier of a function. Whereas if you do some, and this will break, so I don't know if I recommend writing that exact code out. Um, but uh, if you uh, do this slightly differently and you do for async of, and then an empty array or some, some array, then the async will be a keyword. So the keyword switches in those two contexts. Um, so this was a big enough bug that we had to solve it on the spec level. We had to actually uh, disallow async at the beginning of a for loop. So just to give you an idea, it's a rare enough case that we don't need to like really solve it directly, but uh, that was that was a hack in that case, like actually changing the language so that you don't do that. Um, uh, other fun stuff. Uh, I'm trying to think of like fun hacks. Um, another interesting one is just if you mm -hmm. you're running along executing code and you see a slash, there's a bunch of careful work that we have to do preserving state to figure out is this division or a regular expression. Um, and similarly, um, is this an arrow function or a greater than or greater yeah. than or equal? There's like actually a lot of careful passing around of state just to figure out. And you may not know for, for quite some time until you like, uh, here's the closing brace, therefore it's an arrow function. A great example of that uh, and a hack that goes along with it uh, is that when you have um, no semicolons, let's say you're writing your JavaScript without semicolons, <laughs> Ian's space is the right reaction for this. You're writing your code without semicolons and uh, the engine, uh, the thing is the engine when it sees like, you know, expressions running along, um, and let's say we hit a parse error while we're parsing it. What we have to do is we have to reparse this time with a semicolon inserted by the engine to say that, uh, okay, now we run it and see if it works. <laughs> and uh, I, yeah, this is something that we have to do because of the language, but uh, effectively like um, sem automatic semicolon insertion has some really interesting side effects, but that's one way that we deal with the fact that the language doesn't enforce semicolons. Okay, so can you share us the document you talked about? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, uh, should I share it? I don't know how to share it. We'll find mm -hmm. out later. I, I think we, yeah. Yeah, we will find out later. Up. Yes. Just to do not lose track of it. Okay, um, so you are into front-end, front-end engineer, right, Julia? And, um, how does SpiderMonkey differ from other engines? Right, so, so, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. um, so our engine, so all the engines are uh, different, but they're sort of similar. So like we have uh, different, different decisions that we've made in terms of the implementations. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the places where we differ, and you might hear this when some people are talking about um, uh, something called bytecode. Bytecode is, uh, take your JavaScript and simplify it to a super secret language that's inside of the interpreter that you can't run directly. And then the interpreter actually runs the bytecode, not like the not like the big data structure that you get from the tree, but like bytecode. And one place we differ is bytecode. So um, our bytecode is uh, allows us to write our front end so that it's really easy to follow what's happening in the bytecode. But for example, um, uh, JSC, JavaScript core, implements their bytecode so that it's much more high level and they have like big chunks of work that they can complete with the bytecode rather than ours, which is which is pretty low level, like pretty low level. We're working on an almost very specific instruction basis uh, before we get into uh, emit, uh, before we get to actually running the code. So that's one difference. Um, Another difference is uh, this isn't just the parser, but it's uh, we use the engine to implement the engine. It's something called self-hosting. So self-hosted code is when you write the JavaScript feature in JavaScript and then run it through the engine in order to implement that function. So a lot of array stuff is implemented as self-hosted code rather than as um, rather than as stuff that we directly implement into the engine. That's two examples. V8 doesn't have this. They have a special DSL, domain specific language, uh, which they use to implement it. And we've also found problems with our self-hosted code, uh, but at the moment it's not a priority for us to move away from that. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. So, Jove, do you have any questions to Ian? Yes, <laughs> that was a good transition. <laughs> Thank You're you. welcome, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so Ian, uh, you mentioned already that you worked on, work, how is it spelled correctly? Verb, verb. Warp. Warp. Um, so can you give us a quick introduction? What is it and why are you so excited about it? I just recently discovered uh, the call for dog fooding. It's, and uh, yeah, would you give us a quick introduction and what's the latest state about? Can we already use it? Yeah, so um, I mentioned earlier Ion Monkey was our one of the monkeys that we had, and it's um, our highest tier optimization. So when code gets really hot, we would give it to Ion Monkey, and Ion Monkey would make it go as, as quickly as possible. And Ion Monkey has been doing good work for us for seven or eight years now, I think. Um, but with the you know over time, we've realized that there are some things that we would like to change about it. Um, it's, it was really written for a time when there was like a, a certain set of benchmarks that everybody was trying to make fast. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Octane and Kraken and, and Sun Spider. And we've realized that they're not great representations of what JavaScript code on the web looks like. Um, and so Ion was designed to make um, code really, really, really fast if it um, stayed on the, the happy path and did what we expected, but wasn't as good if something unexpected happened. Um, and so warp is our attempt to, to make a JavaScript engine that is better for the modern web and doesn't have the same high speed top maximum. Um, like it, it's not going to run octane quite as quickly, but it is going to do better on a wider variety of code. Um, and so we've been working on it for, for most of the year. Uh, I've been working on it um, as my main project since April or May. And we just got it to a point where, or we got it to a point where we were running it in the browser and we went, wow, we thought we would have to do a bunch of performance improvements and tuning to get it to the point where we wanted to release it for real. But actually this is already quite good. Um, so it, on a lot of real world websites, it's already, even though we haven't spent a lot of time tweaking it and optimizing it and, and really polishing it, it's already faster than Ion Monkey. Um, we were seeing some really nice, just visible improvements where it's like, okay, here's the page in Ion Monkey. Oh yeah, that's that is smoother. That's nicer. Um, and so we, I, I, we're we just turned it on by default in Nightly. So if you're running Firefox Nightly, as of sometime last week, I think you'll be running Warp by default. Um, and we expect it to just sort of make it out into, into release in a, as it rides the trains down, so in a couple of releases. Um, and um, we're, we're really excited about it. We, um, we'd be really pleased if anybody can, can um, find places where it, it's actually slower, because we expect there to be <laughs> things that slow down, um, and we want to, to try and polish those up as well. But it's, um, it's gone better than we'd expected, and we're seeing really good results with it. So we're really, really happy. Um, that connects to my next question, to the follow-up question about where light, there is shadow. Like, how does it work with benchmark, uh, the new optimizations? Like, do you have a regular suite of sites you're testing against? You have your dedicated tests. You take the top uh, X uh, pages uh, from a wizard's point of view. Like, what's, what's your mechanism behind finding the pages you're running the benchmarks against? So there are a number of... of things that we do. There, first of all, there are some suites of benchmark tests that all engines sort of run and, and report their results on. Um, so nowadays, Jetstream 2 is sort of one of the more modern of the like pure, here's a set of benchmarks, try and make yourself fast on these. Um, there's also Speedometer, which is uh, a whole bunch of different frameworks have all written the same to-do app. And you run through that and see how, how you're doing. And that's one of the places where Warp has been a, one of the biggest improvements over Ion. Um, and then we also just, and then we have a set of um, other benchmarks that are sort of full browser benchmarks where we have recorded um, CNN on this day, various, you know, a, a bunch of different websites at a particular time. And then we check to see how quickly can we load the page from beginning to we've painted everything and everything looks good. 
Um, and that's another place where, where warp has been an improvement. Um, so um, in addition to that, sometimes we'll just say, all right, let's turn warp on and then navigate around, check out Google, check out Facebook, check out a variety of sites and just sort of see what's up. Um, we just try and pick sort of popular sites for that. Uh, but a lot of it is, is guessing and using our intuition as to like, what does, what does the web look like in general? Um, um, yeah. All right. So I, I think Natalie has a question. I read something. <laughs> so yeah, I have a question to Julia. So um, we found out you have started a Twitch series, which is called Compiler Compiler. And it's about working on a JavaScript engine, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And can you give us a short introduction about so, it and what's a, um, the so main part, what's the motivation behind it? So why you do it? Next episode. Yeah, oh, look, next week the episode is on Friday, so everybody should <laughs> check it out. Um, so uh, what it is, is it's me. Well, actually, let me tell about the motivation because that's going to make more sense. Yeah. Um, I, uh, my background is I'm a self-taught JavaScript developer. I taught myself JavaScript five years ago and sort of like learned a whole bunch of stuff. And it was like, I really want to work on an implementation. Uh, and SpiderMonkey gave me the opportunity to do that. But at the same time, I'm a JavaScript application developer and I don't know anything about memory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, the stream was sort of a way for me to be like, okay, um, this is a resource I would have loved to have. Uh, just a chance for people to see uh, someone who's coming from my background working on this type of thing, because I would have loved to see how, uh, how this looks from my perspective. So I decided to do it. So the goal of the stream series is to enable JavaScript developers to understand how an engine is built, how a, how a compiler engine for JavaScript is built in case they want to hack on one themselves, or maybe they want to have a better understanding of how the language works or they're coming from a self-taught background as well, and they uh, want to learn a bit of systems programming, but you know, uh, not all resources work for everybody equally, and mm -hmm. uh, a stream like this could really work for people. So that's the goal. And what I'm doing uh, in the stream is I'm trying to get our compatibility as close to the specification as possible so that we have a really, uh, uh, really close implementation to what the current specification says. We're around, I, I can't remember the last number, but uh, I think we were at 90% the last time that I checked. And we just implemented uh, private fields uh, and private methods and top level await is almost finished. I'm just failing uh, like six tests on that test suite and then that'll be done. Uh, and I'll be doing top level await, the full implementation of top level await in the stream. So if anybody wants to watch that, like, <laughs> please come and join. Not this Friday because I need to finish my other work. Okay. Ian, what are you doing tomorrow? What um, am I doing tomorrow? Yes. Well, I mean, I still have a whole day of work ahead of me today. Um, I'm going to be um, looking at um, some, some looking at warp. And um, I told you about inline caches um, and how we leave these notes for ourselves. One of the key ideas behind warp is that we are building up the the um, like the, all of the code that is going to be optimized, we build up from the inline cache notes that we left for ourselves. Um, and so I'm I'm fine doing some thinking about a way to take inline caches where we have a bunch of notes that are almost but not exactly the same and smushing them together into into one sort of um, combined thing that is is now. We're only doing one thing here, and we know what that is, and therefore it's easier for warp to optimize. Um, and um, I have, yeah, I think I have a variety of other projects on the go, but that's the main thing that I think I'm working on right now. Um, I have a, a question to re regarding to the Twitch stream and your role at TC39. So your former chair at TC39, are there any dependencies between your stream and your work there or how does it work? So that's actually a really good question because um, part of what I was doing at TC39 in the chair role is closely related to the Twitch stream in terms of education and enabling people to actually contribute to the spec because contributing to the engine and understanding the engine is one thing, 
being able to read the specification and understanding the discussion that's happening around features is another. And I think we really benefit from developers being able to read the spec and understand what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So when I was chair, uh, which was last year, I stepped down uh, this year to focus on uh, representing Mozilla, uh, but I still do some chair work. So I'm referred to as the Doegger chair. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of like Doeg or Empress, you know, somebody died, so, <laughs> but I still have power, that's what matters. Um, <laughs> uh, so <Yes>. the, <laughs> yeah, that's where the joke is coming from. So the, a lot of what we did was we created repositories called How We Work uh, to help people understand how we work. So that's linked also from the website. We did the website um, and we tried to really improve accessibility at TC39 during my time as chair. And now I've sort of switched off to being uh, just a uh, delegate and I'm continuing that work in terms of uh, helping people understand via the stream. Okay, thank you. So I took a look at our back channel and there are a few questions from live chat and Twitter and other channels. So Jove, maybe you like to start. Yes, uh, so let's go uh, quickly through them. So we collected a couple of questions up front. Some of them are just arriving as well from the YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. um, if you have any questions to Ian or to Julia, please raise them in the chat right next to the live stream or on Twitter using the hashtag JS Congress. And let's start with the first question. <clears throat> so. The first question is perhaps out of scope, but I'd like to know about governance and how the different engines are going to handle the shift with Google's V8 increasing its control over browsers with Edge using it from now on. What work is happening among, uh, among the people who make the decisions with engines to make sure we don't have the issue we had with the 80 plus percent peak market share of IE5? It's mm -hmm. a good question. Um, it uh, touches on a core principle we have at TC39, which is that we operate on 100% consensus. We don't operate on a voting system. If anybody says no, that means no. So uh, we have like 80 people in a room and somehow we agree on stuff like it's really a miracle. Uh, but that means that um, Google has uh, Google can introduce as many delegates as they like, like any member can introduce as many delegates as they like to TC39, uh, but uh, all of the members have a single vote when we vote. So the only time we vote is when we ratify the specification. That's the one time. So there is a sort of escape valve, like there's not really much going into TC39 that doesn't have consent from other browsers. Uh, of course, there is the chance that, uh, you know, like let's say something happens and Google decides to ship something uh, without consent. Uh, and it, maybe it's outside of TC39. Um, this, is, this is a difficult problem. Like uh, we rely a lot on Goodwill that they, uh, for example, there are a lot of non-standard uh, Chrome APIs that people think are standard, uh, especially around debugging um, or other types of things. We don't have any control about that. We can talk to them and we can see about improving specification, uh, but there's no real mechanism to stop that. Um, so use Firefox, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually one of the, so, uh, this is actually one of the places where, like, one of the reasons that Mozilla and Firefox exist. Like, Mozilla is is we're a corporation, but we're owned by a nonprofit whose only goal is to make the web a better place. And one of the ways we do that is by making sure that we have a browser that is good enough, that we have a seat at the TC39 table so that when features come along, we have a voice to say, um, no, we don't think this is good for the web, or actually we think this could be done differently. Um, one, I think really good example, um, hopefully you've heard about WebAssembly and a bunch of really exciting stuff going on there. Originally, Google had come up with a plan called, I think it was called Pinnacle, and it was basically shipping LLVM Byte code and then putting that into the browser and then using that kind of in the same way as WebAssembly. Um, and, and then if, if it was just Google running the, the entire process and we didn't have like independent parties saying, no, 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 maybe there's a better way to do this, then we probably would have ended up with that. But instead, there is this entire standardization process and we said, no, we think we can do something better. And we came and um, 
we have a lot of the people who worked on WebAssembly um, are here at Mozilla, really, really great people. And so we came up with WebAssembly and it's pretty obviously, I think, better than the original proposal. And that's because we have this whole process of consensus. So it's kind of important for, for Firefox and Mozilla to continue to, to exist and have market share so that we can, can try and, and help the web make good decisions. It's something that we care a lot about. Yeah, I, I actually want to follow that up with um, some, uh, I know that a lot of people are sometimes frustrated that we don't have what are seen as standard APIs. For example, one example that's really recent is the battery API, uh, which would allow uh, websites to tell how much battery a person has. And we decided to push back on that and say, no, we don't think that this is a good idea. This shouldn't, uh, and other examples are like the Bluetooth API, and a lot of stuff that has to do with hardware. If we take the example of the battery API, um, one thing that Uber was doing in their native app was checking how much better you had to uh, adjust the prices that you would be paying for your trip. And that's kind of privacy sensitive information. So we pushed back on that being like, no, no, uh, this is a privacy concern. And we don't think that something that reveals this kind of data that can be used in this way should be available to websites. So uh, I know that there's, there was this thread like a few weeks ago about, oh, why doesn't uh, JSC, uh, JavaScript Chrome, um, and spider monkey, yes. Firefox, whatever, you know, <laughs> the whole thing. Why don't we implement these Chrome APIs? But the, it's actually a decision. It's not that we don't have the ability to do so. Uh, we're actively being like, no, we want to advocate for users here. Even though it looks like a really cool feature to have, it can just be used in these ways. That's not great. Yeah. We push back on a number of things for privacy reasons or security reasons and so on. All right. So the next question is, uh, what are the plans on catching up with Chuggler, AKA the Chrome DevTools protocol? Yeah, I used to work on DevTools. Uh, I started at Mozilla on the DevTools team. Um, and I actually worked on our protocol, which I think is better. <laughs> um, I don't think we have to catch up. No, no, uh, actually we are implementing the Chrome DevTools protocol. It has a slightly different design than ours. It's very similar to ours, but uh, because the vast majority of the developer in Mindshare has gone to Chrome. Um, people don't build tools to use our protocol. So we've created this project, it's called the Remote Dev, uh, the Remote Protocol, Remote Debugging Protocol, that's what it's called. And there's a component for it, it's being tracked. Um, yeah, so we are working on it. Uh, the team has suffered a couple of uh, losses. So um, the current, pace is unclear. Um, and additionally, we have another project. Uh, if you recall, two years ago, there was this big thing called Spectre. Everybody forgot about Spectre. Uh, it, it needs to be implemented in DevTools because you need to be able to inspect um, like different layers. Like you've got things coming from different processes and you need to be able to inspect that without having your debugging experience broken. And we have that currently being implemented for our DevTools. But the last information that I had is that the Chrome DevTools didn't have that yet. So uh, we were prioritizing ours so you could have a smooth debugging experience on the browser with our tools and then moving back to the remote debugging protocol. So let's go to the next question, which is as well about plans. Um, <laughs> so the next question is, what are the plans on supporting custom element internals? Also a general question about missing web components APIs, which I think you already covered a bit in the first question. That is, that is an excellent question, but unfortunately, I think it's a question that um, we're not qualified to answer. Um, I think at the beginning I said, you know, we're the JavaScript layer and people hand us JavaScript and then there's the DOM stuff that happens elsewhere. Um, mm -hmm. So that would, I think would be something that the DOM team would be implementing. Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, I could go ask them, but I don't off the top of my head know anything. And I don't yeah. think that you know. I, I know that we've implemented the custom elements API. So I'm wondering which specific ones because we've had it since 63. Um, so maybe there's, uh, I think V1 is, is what we implemented. Maybe there's a new version or maybe something's being experimented with. I'm not too sure. Uh, but yeah, that would be more dumb. But I thought we had it implemented. So if they know which ones aren't implemented, <laughs> complain to the DOM team. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. So the next question is, I think Mozilla went all rust with the quantum CSS uh, engine in production. There is an effort to do the same with SpiderMonkey, where there is a link posted to a GitHub repo, Mozilla-SpiderMonkey slash Rust frontend. I'm wondering 
how that's going and what features that change might enable. Right, so uh, that's paused because of, uh, as, uh, because of Corona. <laughs> <laughs> let's, just, let's just put it like that. It's currently paused. Um, we were hoping to get a lot more speed for implementing things in the front end, which would mean we would get features to users faster. And what's unique about that project is that um, unlike our current parser, which is handwritten, this would be automatically generated and it would be automatically generated from the specification. So if you were a spec writer, you could just write your specification and then we could generate an AST directly from that. What that would also enable is like for people who wanted a super fast parser, uh, you would be of, of JavaScript, you would be able to take our parser and embed it in your project. For example, you're building Babel or something and you want something that will always be up to date or maybe you want to contribute to a parser like this and you want it to be easy to work with. Those are the goals. We actually wanted to make something that was a community project that could be like owned by the community and contributed to by the community. Like I said, it's paused. Uh, I used to be working on that project, <laughs> but at the moment we uh, we need to focus on our running engine, and hopefully we'll pick up on it later. Uh, and to be clear, I think that um, the the Rust front end and Smoosh Monkey are the same thing. Yes, Smoosh Monkey is the Rust front end. <laughs> Just to to make sure that everybody has a nice label to stick on it. And the parser generator is called JSPergus. As you see, we are very good at naming on our team. <laughs> Okay. So, last question for the moment, right? Yes, the last question is about how to track progress uh, progress on Stencil. More about the next generation intermediate representation. Sure. So, Stencil is uh, another project that we've been working on for a while. And the idea there is basically to um, have a uh, slightly clearer separation between the parser and the bytecode emitter and the rest of the engine. And then the idea is that um, all, once we finish, the, the parser doesn't have to worry about garbage collection at all. So garbage collection is the process where when you, you make a bunch of objects in JavaScript and you're not doing, using, a, using them for anything anymore and they just sort of vanish. You don't have to worry about freeing that memory. Um, but we do have to worry about that internally inside the engine. And the idea behind Stencil is we want to have none of no garbage collected objects happening until after out of the parser. And one of the things that lets us do is um, smarter work in terms of caching our bytecode results between visits to a web page. So if you visit a web page once and we do a bunch of work to parse it and have some bytecode, then stencil is a way that we can represent that that is not um, doesn't depend at all about on anything that's currently in the engine. So we can just write that out and then load that back up again. Um, the next time you visit the web page, if we've kept it in the cache and it hasn't been too long, and then the web page will start up a lot faster. Um, we already, we already had some code that did that, but stencil is, is giving us some tools for making that smoother, making that easier to work with. And we have some, I think really interesting projects that we're going to be looking into um, over the next year or so um, for trying to improve our story for like navigating from web page to web page and reusing the work that we've already done. Um, because the, you know, I, when I work on the JIT, maybe I can make things twice as fast um, if I'm really, really lucky. But what's even faster is just not doing work at all because you've already done it and you get to reuse it. So um, I think that there's some, some really exciting opportunities for speeding things up there, um, and we'll see how they play out. I believe that this morning before I got onto this call, I saw somebody in our chat saying that he was about to flip the, the minimum viable product stencil thing and push it out. So this, this work is landing really quickly, but it's a lot of preparatory work, and then taking advantage of it is something we'll be doing um, in the next months. So thanks for sharing all this information about Spider Monkey and Iron Monkey and Giga Monkey and all the other monkeys. <laughs> we are really happy to have you in here today and highly recommend your Spider Monkey newsletter and also Julia's weekly compiler pipe, compiler live stream, not this Friday. This Friday, it'll be this Friday. 
this will Friday. be. Yeah, uh, this but Friday. you have to do lots of stuff. So it's this Friday at 5.30, right? Yes, it's this Friday at 5.30. Uh, at five, is it 5.30? I can't remember. Whatever time it says on my schedule. I think it's 5. Okay. <laughs> um, we checked it. 5.30. Okay. And we, we will... <laughs> <laughs> we will share the links and also the link to the documents we talked about. Huh. We talked about Jason's document about parsing JavaScript. And how yes, and I, I was wondering right now because someone um, copied the link in our shared document right now. So Julia can check it if it's right or not. So. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I posted it. <laughs> Are you posted it? Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't saw the name. No worries. <laughs> Thanks a lot. All right. So, so I want to say a huge thank you as well for the team behind the scenes, for Robin, who is taking care about collecting all the questions from Twitter, YouTube, chat, and uh, all the different sources. And to Marco as well, who is taking care about uh, the AV and the, the technique and live streaming is running as, yeah, as expected. And also to Natalie, uh, thanks for jumping on that spontaneously and moderating. And yeah, definitely to Ian and Julia, a huge, huge thank you for joining us. We get a bit extended and over time. And uh, yeah, I think we can call it a day right now. Thank you very thanks much. For us on. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thanks, Johannes. I think the stream is ended now. Oh, mm -hmm. good. Um, thanks for extending, no, for extending and this is giving now, your meeting. Uh, the outtakes are happening right now. <laughs> Slip on a banana peel. <laughs> so right now it's the time.